Three, two, one. Well, thank fellow, it's Friday yet again. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be with you here once again. It's the 6th of November, and believe it or not, this is episode 89 this year. So we are going to try and break the 100 barrier by the time we get to the end of the year. Um, we're all feeling a little bit shell-shocked here today. There's a, such a lot going on. This is my sixth Zoom meeting this morning. So whoever, whoever said Zooms make life easier, they'd obviously not run six meetings all in one go. So, I, so if I'm flagging a little bit or I start to nod off, then I'm sure my partner in crime, Jackie Mount, will doubtless wake me up. Although I have to say, Jackie has been taping her presentations for the summit today or at least some of them so she's been doing end-to-end -end, um television bits as well so uh we're we're sort of propping each other up today hi jackie how's yeah. it going hi everyone hi gary um okay well it was going quite smoothly until the chancellor made the announcement yesterday but slight extensions to uh the uh, uh coronavirus job scheme so i just want to pick up on a few bits today and take any questions um okay he so did ring I, up and ask what we thought so you know i sorry? did say I, I, he did ring up and ask what we thought i said no jackie's okay she's fine so <laughs> yeah i just sort of <laughs> caught it actually on the tail end or something i was doing last night and i thought oh here we go again so i've done a quick look and i think i've got uh, the most of what's happening okay if you remember then last week we were talking about the extension to cjrs um, the job retention scheme. And we've got a couple of updates on that. Now, what basically has happened is the extension to the job retention scheme. And I did get a little bit confused last week. And I have to say, I do have to thank Sarah Douglas because I rang her Friday last week, Friday evening, and we talked about what was happening in Scotland and Wales and the devolved administration because. I suddenly thought I had a funny five minutes. I completely misunderstood it. But so thank you, Sarah, if you're listening for your help last week. Now, basically what's happened is that with effect from the 1st of November, as we all know, England, as of Wednesday or yesterday, Wednesday, I've lost track, yesterday, oh. have gone into lockdown. Today was Thursday, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> Wales has been in lockdown for two weeks and they're just coming to the end of that. And Scotland has got local lockdowns in various areas. And I know that Scotland is deciding what it's going to do. Now, where we are at the moment is that the lockdown itself and what people can do in each area and what's open and what's closed is down to each government. However, the furlough scheme is nationwide. So that's all UK businesses. So basically where we are at the moment, right the way across the board from the 1st of November, and the chancellor hasn't backdated it for Wales to the last week of October or for the areas of Scotland. So at the moment we're looking at the 1st of November, we have the extended uh, job scheme. And what was gonna happen is that the government was going to pay 80% of non-worked hours uh, on the furlough basis at 80% until the 2nd of December, which was the England lockdown. And then Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, we weren't sure what was gonna happen. Now, what happened yesterday is that the chancellor announced that the furlough scheme nationwide is going to be extended at least until the 31st of uh, well, until the end of March, but the 80% is being paid up to the end of January. And then he will decide whether that will continue at 80%. I suppose, depending on what's happened to the number of infections and what's happening in each area, he will then decide by the end of January what's going to happen for uh, February and March. So where we are at the moment then is we now have the furlough scheme, a flexible furlough scheme, which is open from the 1st of November to the end of January, and the government will pay 80% of all non-work hours. Now that is regardless of whether you're closed or you're open. Obviously, if you're a closed business that can't work because of lockdown, your non-work hours will be 100% of your hours. So you'll pay 80% of the full wages or the employer will. But if you're in a business which is open, it's an essential business, then you will pay 80% of the non-worked hours. Now, now, under the flexible furlough, what this means is that 
they could be operating shorter hours or they could be operating full time hours, but with fewer staff and they can furlough staff and it can be done on a flexible basis. And the 80% um, of the non worked hours can be claimed back, but the employer pays the employer's national insurance and the employer's pension contribution. So we're right back where we were in August. Now, there are a couple of questions that have cropped up that I still don't have the answers to because the detailed guidance still hasn't really come out. That's basically what are we basing the hourly rate on? Is it based for flexible contracts where we were looking at last year or is it the last 12 months? That I still don't know, which is, I'm sorry to say, I can't give you the answer to that. If anybody else has found the answer to that, please pop it up if you're listening in either the, the chat line or the questions and answers. I certainly haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, we did have a question last week about the job retention bonus, this 1,000 pounds, which was due to be paid at the end of January. Now that has, as of yesterday, been deferred. Because the uh, job retention scheme is now going up to the end of March, that means that the job retention bonus is no longer valid. That has been deferred and the government will announce what is going to happen to that later on uh, next year. So my gut reaction will be is that it won't come in until at least the 31st of March, um, if it's that. So you're going to have to keep keep people on for a lot longer to bear that. But definitely the February one has now gone. That was a question from last week. Now, the portal for the claims will open on the 11th of November. We do have that. And basically, the claims for the first month must be put in by the 14th of December. Now, after that, the first month, the claims must be paid. Sorry, the claims must be put in by the 14th of the next month. So November must be done by the 14th of December. December must be claimed by the 14th of January. So it's a much shorter claim period. Uh, last week, I did say that the claims could be made in advance, but I haven't got an update on that. So basically what we're doing is we're looking at paying on a monthly or a weekly basis, doing the RTI and then claiming back by the 14th of the next month. Um, the other big change is to the uh, self-assessment grant. Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes. Last week, we were looking at an average from November through to February, no, November to January of 55%. So that was 80% for your November profits and 40% for December and January. That's now been extended to 80% across the full um, three months with a cap of £7,500. So that is a lot more generous than it was originally. There will be a second grant covering uh, February, March and April, but we don't yet know what the percentage is going to be. Um, as the Chancellor will announce the uh, job retention scheme furlough percentages, so he will announce what percentage is going to be for the self-employment. So at the moment, you can claim for the three months at 80% uh, of your average profits. As far as I am aware, the dates for eligibility for the SAIS grant is exactly the same as they were for grants one and two. I see nothing that changes the dates. So unfortunately, as it stands at the moment and as I understand it, and please correct me if you've seen something that I've missed, if you didn't submit your 1819 tax return, you are still not eligible to claim the SAIS because the eligibility, you had to have been able to claim SAIS one and two, even if you didn't claim it to claim SAIS 3. Um, so that's the updated information as I have it at the moment. Um, lots of questions coming in, but I have had, before I go into the questions, I have had a couple of queries on uh, redundancies. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen, uh, if I can find it, it's this one share screen um okay these are the eligibility criteria which as far as i'm aware are still the same let me just uh pop that up um and make that a bit larger okay so remember if to receive funding under the new scheme um they have to have been on the payroll by the 30th of october and you have to have done an rti for that 
in order for the, you to be able to claim. That RTI had to go in by 23.29, 23.59 on the 30th of October. Now, if you have already made staff redundant or they have left, if they were on the payroll before the 23rd of September, and then they were made redundant or stopped working after that, you can bring them back and qualify for the scheme. Now, I've had some uh, emails coming in, which I will come back to on a one-to-one -one basis to you, those that have sent them in, but one in particular has a client who has laid people off and paid redundancies, but has not yet put the P45 through HMRC. So as far as HMRC is concerned, they are still eligible uh, they are still employed now as it stands at the moment i think it will be perfectly okay to cancel their uh notice period and furlough them but you are going to have to make some adjustments to the pay because if you've paid them in advance you're going to have to do all sorts of adjustments but there is no reason why they shouldn't be taken back and put on furlough but for example a member of staff has been paid a lump sum redundancy that is going to have to be paid back so it's taken out of the wages so i'm not quite sure how that's going to work but but i i think that will work and i also have one quick question came through where somebody has asked if they they understand that they the employer pays the employer's national insurance and pension scheme but can they came claim back the employee's nic and pension scheme now the answer to that is no because that is not a cost to the business. That is something that the employee pays. So they have their gross pay, they pay their tax and um, NIC and their pension contributions, and they get their net pay. That is unchanged. That is not the business's money. That's the employee's money. And the employees still have to pay tax and NI on what they earn. So um, the answer to that one was a no. And I also have one on maternity pay where um, a member of staff has gone on very early maternity leave for a number of reasons. And what is the situation with uh, paying that? Because this particular person um, is going to be in hospital for quite some time. They would like to start statutory maternity pay when they come out of hospital. I don't actually think that's going to be possible because um, maternity pay must start on the day the baby was born at the latest. So, a couple of quick questions there, things you might like to think about if anybody's got any comments. Uh, let me just stop that. Now, my slides are up on the COVID web from last week. I have updated the hub as it was last week. I haven't updated with yesterday's details, so I will get that done probably over the weekend, so it'll be there for Monday. Um, and uh, any questions? Let's have a look at what we've got. Got one on the chat line. This is Heather Palmer. I have a client who started a new employee in October. Our payroll bureau filed the RTI on the 30th of October, which included this employee. But we are being told she cannot now be furloughed as his pay date is the 5th of November. Yeah. My client had this coffee kiosk, and I'm sure he has been forced to close. Is this correct? I think it probably is because the pay date has to have been done by the 30th. This is one presumably where the RTI has gone in early. Um, it's very unfortunate. So, These pay dates. Um, could you please repeat? I think this is the. That's theory. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, I think this is the situation where the pay month always goes from the 6th to the 5th. Um, and if you're doing your pay date up to the 5th, even if you've done your RTI, if your payday is stated as the fifth, obviously it's not going to be possible because they've not been paid. So, yeah, I think that's um, that's correct. And I'm really sorry that, as the Chancellor has said from day one, there are always going to be people that are going to fall through the cracks. Um, um, I got one there just finally on on the on the link through there from oh they're coming in all the time. Heather says thank you. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Cyril, now I might be pronouncing this wrong. It's either Boine or Boine. What is the situation for part-time employees zero hours when on furlough? Do they accrue some holidays on the furlough payments? Yes. The answer to that is yes. That holidays accrue while you're on furlough. It's the same as uh, when if you're on maternity leave or anything like that. Holidays will accrue. Now the holiday calculation is going to be quite complex. Um, 
and therefore you've got to go back and work it out because the old 12.07% no longer works. It's got to go back over 52 weeks and it's an average. And I'm dealing with quite a lot of queries from members on this at the moment with zero rate. So yes, the answer to that is yes. And on the questions, Jenny apologizes for giving you four questions all in one go. So I don't, know if you want <laughs> don't to worry, Jenny. At a time. Do you want to do those one at a time, Jackie? Um, can you employees whose employment started from the first of the 11th claim for furlough? No, I think they have to have been in place by October. So if you're taking someone new on, I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to furlough them because the eligibility for the scheme is that they had to have been paid and RTI'd by the 30th. So I think the answer to the first one is naught. Can a new employee claim furlough from November if they've not previously claimed from furlough before? Yes, they can. As long as all the employment eligibility is fulfilled, they can claim for November. Um, is the extended furlough payment rate still the old hourly rate to claim the 80%? That's the one I don't yet know, Jenny, and I will try and, <clears throat> I will try and find that out. And are employees allowed to be on flexi furlough at two separate workplaces? Uh, yes, I think they probably are. Um, yeah. They can be furloughed. It, we always, uh, if you remember back to the fixed furlough days, they could claim furlough in one and work for another. So the answer to that one, I think, is yes. Um, oh, questions coming in thick and fast. Uh, they are, actually. They're building up with, with wait, yeah, we've got a lot coming in this morning. Terry Ram, hi, guys. With the extended furlough, do you know how the calculation is to be done for new employees on zero hours contracts, e.g. worked September, October? Is it average or just based on last month? Also, do old claimers continue yeah. on old minimum wage rates and new claimants at new minimum wage just want to get the calculation correct? Obviously, yeah. Terry, what you would. I think I've, we're going to get lot. I've, I've got lots of questions on this one, Terry, and somebody else has already asked that. I think I'm going to go away and have to do some research and get something up on our hub. I'll get something out to you. Um, I have not seen anything about the rate of pay whether it's the old rates that we're using or whether it is the new rate. And I do need to try and find that out. I've seen nothing in the guidance yet. Um, they haven't got the calculator up as far as I'm aware. So I'm sorry, I can't ask that one, but I will follow up on it and get back to you as soon as I can. Ali rate, old on you. Um, right, so let me just take out the ones that we've done so we can see where we are. Great. So done that one. Um, we're down. Lucy, uh, Lucy Zakan, I presume that is. Please excuse me if that's not the case. Hi, Jackie. On the extended furlough scheme from 1st of 11th to 20, what is the basis salary on which we work out the 80% furlough pay on previously furloughed staff and more importantly, new furlough staff? No previous, not previous. Yes, again, this hourly rate, I will try and get back to you as soon as I can um, as to what we're basing it on. Um, we're going to get a lot of these, and I'm sorry. I have not been able to find it, but I will get something. I will start chasing people down for this detail. Um, Holly Tires is an interesting one we've had before. I've just had a client tell me that she wants to reinstate a lever from last month so that she can get furlough pay. Um, yeah, she can do as long as you follow the eligibility rules, which um, there is the date of, hang on, let me just check eligibility. Uh, they had to have been on the payroll on or before the 23rd of September and were made redundant after that date. So as long as they didn't leave before the 23rd of September, you can re-employ them and you can furlough them. However, I think um, this is the moral question that's come up before. It's got to be on the basis that they are going to be maintained after the end of the furlough if this is just you looking after a mate or an ex-employee and trying to be nice to them then i think that is a different ball game altogether and you need to be very careful with that yeah um and also i think you're going to have to watch the dates because hmrc are being a lot stricter at the moment on this time round. um as they get more experience themselves they're getting a lot stricter on what what they're allowing and what they're not allowing so um well Yes, I mean, if if it's if the redundancy or someone who's left, if they've left because perhaps they've gone to another job and that job has stopped and they want to come back, that's fine because they were allowed to do that at the start. And then I think we deal with 
what's going to happen with the job at the end of it so I think the answer is probably yes even though morally ethically we're not sure but I think the answer possibly is yes to that one uh, Carol Webb, hi Carol, thanks for this. Saw this morning that if they have already been furloughed, the rules stay on the calc based salary. This seems to me, this is why I want to look into this because I think what Carol's seen this morning is that if they've been furloughed previously, we're using the same hourly calculations, but if they've not been furloughed previously, then I don't think you've got anything to base it on. So yeah, this is, I will try and get something back to you. We might have to come back maybe early next week, Gary, and see if we can get something out on this before next Friday, because we do. Yeah, we might try and squeeze one in before conference, perhaps Monday. Uh, yeah, if we've got and I'll uh, see if I can get some, I, I may or may not get something for Monday. And Holly said, do I add her as a new employee? Thanks. Yes, I think you just have, you can't reinstate them. I think you have to put them in as a new employee. Um, I don't quite know how you deal with reinstating, but when you do your, your submissions, you do have to give the NI number and that should show that that person was on the RTI previously and it should pick up and, and check. So I would reinstate her as a new employee. And I think I might have confused a few people there. I said, sneak you in on Monday before conference. Of course, conference is the week after. So <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, don't, uh, yeah, everybody's got shot into a panic, no doubt. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. about that. It's yeah, yeah, it's all right. Week. Not a problem. It, 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 talking about it all the time, you think it's coming quicker than it is. But anyway, on we go uh right lisa hi lisa if an employee started on the 20th of september 28th september but the first rti was the 31st of march so not eligible initially for furlough they haven't been removed from the payroll but submitted zero pay april october can they now be furloughed i think the answer to that is probably yes but if they've had no salary well, <laughs> We have a problem with zero hours workers because way back at the start of flexible furlough, we had this discussion about the ethics of zero hours workers. And if you had no work for them, could you still furlough them? And there is that one is still rebounding round. We have a um, an, an inquiry in from a member where a zero hours person was basically not given any work and was not furloughed and is now saying they believe they should have been furloughed. And this is opening up a whole can of worms. So again, anything to do with flexible hours, working pay, I'll have to come back to you. Um, right, Bev, hi Bev. If the business closed and paid staff off on the 29th of September, can they re-employ them and put them uh, on furlough, I think the cutoff date is the 23rd of September. If they can, what date do they re-employ them from the 30th of September or the 1st of no 6th of November? Well, the, the furlough goes back to the 1st of November. So I think it's not the lockdown date, it's the 1st of November. So it's not to, today, which is the 6th. So I think you can re-employ them from the 1st. I think it also depends on what you mean by closed down. If yeah. it's a something like that and it, it, it just closed the doors that's one thing if it closed down shut up shop and and went through into insolvencies or whatever you can't suddenly start no, coming. because the, the jobs have to still realistically be there i think yeah but if this is going to rescue you the business and get you up and started once we get through this whenever that might be then i think you you have a, an ability to do that but be prepared to answer questions from uh, from hmrc really um, and we've got a lot of questions coming in on this hourly rate. Um, does the furlough scheme have a lower age limit? Um, it depends how low you want to go. Remember, anybody under 16 doesn't have a national insurance number, so therefore you cannot claim through the portal for that. I think there was a problem. I think you have to ring in. We did talk about under 16, some people without a national insurance number. So I don't know. I think it depends on what the job is, really, because you're looking at the number of hours that they were being paid. Um, lower age limit. I'm not sure if it goes under 16. Yeah. I don't think it should. My personal view is it shouldn't go under 16 because that's the age at which I think realistically uh, we're talking about. Um, Beverly, now, I'll I've got a couple of comments coming in, actually. Uh, Susanna's come in and Racer's come in. Um, saying that they understand if they've been previously furloughed, 
It's based on the original hourly counts that we did, which was based on the previous year. If they haven't been previously furloughed, then it's mm. based on new, newly furloughed staff pay will be based on the current tax year. Well, I think it probably has to be because originally, if you took people on, you, you've got no historical data from last year. What I need to look into is that that seems slightly unfair that if you've got two members of staff, one who's been working for a long time and has been furloughed and was that their, their average salary, their sorry, their hourly rate is based on the previous year and someone who's now been employed and is going to be on a higher rate. I think you've got to I think we've got some problems with the hourly rate. And as I said, we're going to get a lot of questions on this and I do need to go away and uh, do some proper research on this. And I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you today. Um, I think Caroline was got a legal sort of HR question here. I mean, I'll mention it anyway, but for staff that have been made redundant, or oh, moving about a bit, on the 31st of October, I understand that these staff can be rehired and then put on furlough. However, how long before they can start the redundancy process again? That doesn't sound quite right to me. What are the no, legalities? Because, um, ending, I don't it? think you should take them back on to defer redundancy. I think you've got to take them back on. Now, again, this is a difficult one because under the job retention scheme, redundancies were allowed to happen. And this is almost like it's deferring the redundancy date to give them a bit more money and then make them redundant. Um, Slightly different to when we were looking to, is it really only two weeks ago, at the job support scheme, where you couldn't put them, make them redundant during that, during the period of the job support scheme, but that's obviously now been put off on hold. All that work we did on that, thank you, that's all gone. Um, redundancies, yeah, again. I think this is going to be more questions I can't answer than questions I can today, and I'm really sorry, folks. Um, 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 um. Have you got this one here from Autonom uh, Anonymous? I think that might well be worth you reading that one. I have a client with two directors. One has been on maternity leave for the whole of the period of COVID and the other decided not to take any salary during this period. However, they now want to claim furlough from November to December. Can the director who chose not to take salary now claim furlough as he won't have been on the payroll? Presuming presumably not. Well, let's deal with the director first. Directors can be furloughed. The problem under flexible furlough is, I think, how do you work out what the non-working hours are? Because presumably they've been working but haven't been taking a salary. So if you're now suddenly going to say they're going to be working and paying part-time, how do you ascertain what are the worked hours and what are the non-worked hours and hence what percentage are you going to, to take? Um, presumably there has been a nil return done over the last few months. Um, the individual coming back from maternity leave can be furloughed and you have to go back and look at the hours that they would have been on, the rate they would have been on before they went on maternity pay. So if I, if I remember, you don't include the maternity pay as part of their average because that is much reduced you go back to what their salary was. And again, we're into okay. what they're being paid at their old salary and the new people have been paid at the new salary. And I think this is something that somebody is gonna to have to come up with a definitive answer somewhere. Um, oh, Alison, hi, Alison. How does the CJRS claim work for companies that pay mid-month, e.g. the 19th? The RTI is submitted just before the 19th of month. So the first part of the payroll will have missed the 14th of deadline for claiming. Um, I, I'm just looking at the date. So if you're paying on the 14th of November, I think when you claim on the 14th of December, I've got, still got a funny feeling that I read somewhere last week that you can claim in advance. Um, it's not like the job support scheme where you had to put the RTI in, and then you claim back the job, support scheme, the job support scheme grant. This one, I'm sure I've read something, you can apply up to the 14 days in advance. So you might be able to claim for your period up to the 14th of November and then claim for the next two weeks to the end of November in the 14th of December claim. And then what's happening is that you're moving forward month by month 
um, but claiming on the 14th of the month, but you're actually claiming for the previous month. Okay. Wow, you are busy today, folks. I knew we were going to be. Yeah, we're going well, well over oh, 40. Oh, there's a nice one, Lisa. Someone who learned a lesson. If a director was paid a salary and dividends to March 20, but since April 20 has taken all payments on salary, can their furlough be increased accordingly? Again, I think we're going back to looking at the average. If the rule still stands, as it did under flexible furlough, that we're looking at the average of the past year or the month, whichever is higher, then it would seem to me that the new salary would, would count. So you would be looking for November at the average of the last 12 rolling months. So at the moment, it's going to be down a bit. We haven't got a November because I think if they were only taking a, a minimum salary and dividends last November, they're going to be better off averaging the 12 months. It's interesting to know the company's house has just uh, put some figures out that there has been a 30% increase in the number of limited companies registered. Yeah. And I think this is a lot of self-employed people who suddenly decided actually they're better off being uh, employ uh, a limited company. And um, Bill Dodwell from the uh, Tax Simplification Office, uh, he's hopefully coming up uh, into conference for us. But the number of people that have suddenly now stopped paying dividend only and are paying themselves a salary, so they've opened up a PAY scheme, has also rocketed. And I, and yeah. I think that that's one of the, the things that government has been trying to do for many years, might well now have come about by default. So it'd be yeah. interesting to see if, if he's sitting there with a big grin on his face now. I don't know. Yeah, because I mean, if you think back right to the early days when uh, a lot of directors took... Um, took dividends rather than salaries. Now we, we had, there was a lot of controversy going right back to March, April about this um, because people were saying, well, it's not fair because if I had put everything through uh, PAYE, I would actually have ended up paying a lot more tax and insurance than if I take it as dividends, which is true. However, the whole scheme was based on the amount of tax and NI that you've paid. So our, both Gary and my view and a lot of people's views were, well, if you weren't paying the tax and NI, why should you be able to claim on the grant now? So I think that's why. And it's been yeah. offset now by the amount that you would pay. We did go through it with, with one member I know in the very early days um, who was trying to, who was quite rightly justifying why this particular member took dividends, but unfortunately fell through the cracks. And uh, yeah, so a lot of people have, have changed. Um, I was, um, when I was in practice, I worked with an accountant who used to do a lot of my year end for me. Um, and her view always was that um, a director should take a minimum of a thousand pounds a month in salary and then take the rest in dividends if they want to. And that gives them that minimum figure, which is still not very high, but it shouldn't be less than that because no. it's to do with the amount of national insurance you contribute to lead into things like pension contributions and getting enough contributions by the time you reach state retirement age. So my view is unless you have other forms of income, if your limited company is your main source of income, then you really should look at the amount you take out and you pay national insurance on. So I will get and off if my I mic. think back so, to when we first started this, I think you actually did a calculation, didn't you, Jackie, on the difference between yeah. the two. It wasn't hugely different. It wasn't huge, but it was fairly significant but unfortunately this has now sort of almost come home to roost because mm. it is having a knock-on effect and what I've always said to people is you've got to look at the long-term picture because although you might be saving on tax and NI now maybe not even paying NI if you don't pay sufficient national insurance contributions it is going to hit you down the line when you reach state retirement age um, and for all of you out there who have got a long way to go before state retirement age then um, it's a significant difference it could be yeah, just like me and you, Jackie. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> been there a long time. So, um, 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 right, let's have a quick look down the chat line. Um, Sue Joyce has said, the business still has to pay NIC and pensions. My son's company say they will not take back employees as they say it's too expensive. This is an individual thing. Um, if companies still cannot afford to pay the... Uh, employers national insurance and pension contributions then that is a decision that the company has to take i was listening to uh, they were interviewing um somebody who runs a pub in my area and they were talking about yes this is great to help with uh employees wages but his fixed costs that he still has to pay 
over and above any grants he can get is something like £150,000 a year. And he was saying it's actually not viable to carry on because of what he has to pay, in, you know, the way his contract is with the brewery and things. And it's still going to mean that a lot of people are not going to be able to be taken back on because for small businesses, it's still a fairly big expense to them if they've got hardly any or no income. So yeah, I, I do sympathize. Um, ah, hang on, John Alabaster's coming. Thank you, John. It's been updated today, but it looks like those who have been previously furloughed Use whatever you did previously for new claims. Use the average of pay from the 6th of April. I think, yeah, this is what others are coming back with, John. Um, so I will try and confirm this to you as soon as possible. Um, and Carol Shipley. Hi, Carol. Uh, says, hi, Jackie and Gary. Can I just clarify the following? From your point about the employee with a 5th of November payday. If an employee started on October with a monthly date of 31st, and you submitted the RTI by the 30th, will they still qualify? Yes, they will. The RTI was due by the 31st, but actually filed on the 29th. It had to have been filed by midnight at the end of the 30th, so 23.59. Because interestingly enough, there was quite a lot going around in the press the other day about when does the furlough start? If it started at midnight on Thursday, was that midnight Wednesday night Thursday or midnight Thursday night Friday? which for me was quite important because unfortunately my grandson who had a driving test booked back in April, which was canceled because of the close down, had his test rebooked and it was for nine o'clock on Thursday morning. And of course it's been put off again because it started midnight Thursday morning. So. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting one from Pauline Chapman. One of my clients has an employee who is going into hospital for an operation and could be off for a few weeks. She's currently taking some of her holiday allowance. Could she then be furloughed instead of being paid statutory sick pay? I mean, I think the answer to that is no, because you have to be available for work. Um, yes, but if they're going to be in hospital and take holiday. Oh, no, you can't take holiday when you're off sick, can you? No, you can't. You don't. You can say not to. Difficult one, that one, because I think if they're not working, they've got to be on statutory sick pay and then furlough them when they're fit to work. You can do that. Yeah, but it, the, the whole point of being must be available for must work. Must be available to work. Yeah, I think. Um, Lucy's come back saying if they. Oh, sorry, Jeff has put the link up on there, which you won't be able to see, but I have got the link up on the um, presentation slides on the COVID hub on the website. So if anybody wants the links, it's, it's up on the COVID hub. Lucy yeah. says if a member of staff has had their contract changed in September, and had been on furlough previously, but not through COVID, just working less days than before. Her new gross pay is less than back in February. How do we work out the furlough pay for November based on February's pay if they're doing less hours? I need to think about that one, Lucy. I think you might have to do the average. Um, again, average. I need to go back through all my notes because I have a funny feeling we've probably answered a lot of these questions earlier, but I need to go right the way back through all my notes. I'll part that one, Lucy, and come back. Uh, we've done Pauline. Um, can an input, Liz, Elizabeth Jones, hi Elizabeth. Can employees be furloughed for the first time as long as they're on RTI on the 30th? Yes, they can. They don't have to have been furloughed previously. Claire G81, hi, please could you explain how furlough would work for employees who still have a large amount of annual leave to use by December 31st? We are possibly wanting to put two employees on furlough, but they will have almost a full year's allowance of leave left to take. Do we have to ask them to use their annual leave before we put them on furlough? Or do we put them on furlough and just top up the annual leave date? Well, you can carry holiday over to next year. I think is it two weeks you can carry over but yeah. that has to be an agreement with the between the employer i can't remember how much you can carry over but you can carry holiday over for possibly up to two years now again that's going to have a cost implication because you're going to be getting double because you'll have all of next year's holidays so that might not be feasible it's got to be done in agreement um you're going to have to pay them full wage for holiday 
So if you put them on holiday before you furlough them, you're going to have to pay 100% and not have them working for you. If you put them on holiday after you've furloughed them, you've still got to pay 100%, but you can claim 80% back. So I think that adds up to put them on a holiday when they're furloughed because it will cost the company less. Um, mm. A lot of grey area. Getting any easier. This is not getting any easier, is it, folks? <laughs> Yeah. Um, Susanna's just found the link. Yeah, that's the one that, that Jeff put up. So we will get that up. Um, let me see if I can, uh, if I can, no, I can't copy that. Um, Susanna or Jeff, could you put that link up in the chat line rather than the question and answer line so that people can see it, please? Because I can't actually copy it and transfer it across. So if one of you could copy that into the chat line, then I think everybody else should be able to see it. That's the link across. Oh, thank you, Susanna. That's gone up there. So if you want the link, uh, everyone click on that, pick it up. And then that's where the link, this is where I have to say where I got a lot of the information from, um, but I haven't had a chance because I've been doing a few other bits and pieces since yesterday. Okay, Susanna. Um, employees not claimed for previously do not need to have been furloughed. No, that's true. They don't need to have been furloughed previously. This is section 2.2 .2 of that guidance that Suzanne has come back with. Um, uh, for furlough, for employees meeting the eligi oh, can't even say, eligibility criteria and were previously furloughed, employers must use the same calculations for calculating reference pay and usual hours. So this is confirmation of what everyone's been saying. Thank you, everyone. Um, for an employee who meets the criteria of the extended scheme but was not previously eligible, the alternative calculations of reference pay and usual hours must be used for all other employers, employees, employers must use the calculation for reference pay for usual hours. Yeah, I, I will follow that through and um, so that's 2.2. Okay. Well, hi, Jules, Buckkeepers in Buckingham. Um, that's a, uh, yeah, this is a tough one. How uh, minimum, yeah. Is there a minimum period they need to be furloughed to be able to claim? No, there isn't really because we're into flexible furlough. It's not like the original scheme where they had to be furloughed for a minimum of three weeks. This starts on the 1st of November and for any hours worked and for any hours not worked, um, you can make a claim. So I don't think there's a minimum period there. Jules. Oh, um, now Carla's put one up in the, uh, sorry, let's go back to holiday from Paula. If you put them on holiday pay when they are furloughed, the employee only has to top up 20% and the 80% can be reclaimed. Yeah, that's what, that, that's what I was trying, trying to get across. I bet you've done it much better than me. Um, if you put them on holiday, before you furlough them, you're, you're going to lose their work and you're going to have to pay them the full 80%. If you put them on holiday after they're furloughed, you've only got to top up the 20%. So it will actually cost you less to put them, get them to take that holiday pay when they're on furlough. Uh, Yolanda uh, says she can't see the link. Okay, um, you need to go into uh, the gov.uk if you can't see the link and put a query in that says extension to the coronavirus job retention scheme and it should link you into it. Um, HMRC or gov.uk is getting a little bit better with picking up search inquiries now. Uh, Lucy's again is back on variable hours. Um, Jules again, hi, I have a new client who started a hairdressing company in September, then went through the payroll at £732 per month per director, but is now closed for four weeks. They were self-employed till September. Are they entitled to a self-employment grant? No, I don't think so, because if they've gone into a limited company, they're no longer trading. And I think you, when you go for the SAIS grant, you have to be able to state that you are currently trading and that your, um, your income has been affected due to coronavirus. So if you are no longer 
self-employed, then you can no longer claim it. However, are you still officially self-employed or have you actually canceled that with HMRC? That's another ethical one, I think. Um, and Judith's come back confirms, been told by someone um, who asked HMRC that if someone was old furlough, it's old minimum and new staff on new minimum. So thank you everyone for that. Um, I think, yeah, if they've been previously furloughed, it's back on the old wages. If they're new staff, it's on the new wages. I have to say, I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna make any comment on that. Um, can I confirm I have this right? We can still flexibly furlough or is it straight work or furlough? No, it's flexible furlough, Nisa. So we're right back where we were in August. Okay, it's exactly the same. It's flexible furlough. There are no minimum or maximum hours. Um, you're paying, you're claiming back 80%, but you have to pay the employers, employers national insurance and pension contributions. Do you have to apply workplace pension deductions on furlough payments? Yes, you do. So pension contributions are still there as they always have been. It's just that the government's not funding it anymore. Uh, Claire says, I have a SAIS grant question. Uh, not sure what the question is, Claire. It may come I, in I, a minute. Yeah, it might come in a minute, I think. Uh, Catherine says, the director only company wants to furlough himself as the company is closed for the next four weeks. Can he claim 80%? He does pay himself a monthly dividend. Does that affect his ability to claim? Yeah, if well, he's if closing all down... He pays a, yeah, he can't if he's closing that. down, the dividend doesn't count. It's purely on his PAY. So if he's taking all his income out as a dividend, then he's not entitled to furlough himself. And don't forget, if you're furloughing yourself completely, you have to be not working at anything in the business unless it's actually keeping the business going. You cannot do any income generation work as a director. That stands, which is why I'm saying if you're going into flexible furlough for directors, you've got to look at what they're doing in their work hours and the fact that they cannot do any income generation in their furloughed hours, which is going to be very, very difficult uh, to separate out. And I'm so glad, folks, I'm not doing payroll anymore. Um, Nicola's come back and confirmed that. Yes, I think that's great. And, oh, thank you, folks. Thank you, Susanna, Nicola. Uh, there's another just, one here. Just quickly about Nicola. I understand, uh, I am told, that Nicola has just been invited to sit on our council. So well done, Nicola. Congratulations well done. on that, you know, yeah. Uh, right, where are we? That's it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Susanna's just come back and said they're going to share... The updated reference periods are going to be released for these calculations on the 10th of November, which I think is Tuesday. So um, hopefully, as uh, if that's coming out on Tuesday, maybe we can uh, do something Tuesday afternoon, unless it comes out four o'clock on Tuesday. And um, well, watch this space, and if we have anything important to come out, we I'm sure Gary and I'll come out and, and help you. Oh, uh, Claire. I oh, this is a nice one. I have a CIS subcontractor who approached me in March as he wanted to claim the SAIS, but transpired he hadn't ever done a tax return. Clearly wasn't oh. eligible then. Oh. But since then, I have submitted returns for 17, 18 and 19, 20, which have been accepted by HMRC. Do you think he will be eligible for SAIS 3? That's suck it and see, isn't it? Um, if you go on, there, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> there is an eligibility checker, and if it's not up there yet, it will be. I think what you have to do, or your client has to, I think you might be able to do it as a as an agent. Go on and put the details in, and it will tell you if they're entitled to claim. Now, if they have accepted those tax returns and he's eligible, then yes, he can claim. But if because it was very late, they may say, no, you can't because you've been an auto boy and you haven't been putting your tax returns in. Um, so I would go on and Claire and check the eligibility uh, criteria for that one, please. This is more uh, food for uh, Bill Dodwell. Uh, you know, the number of people that our members are saying now have suddenly come out and decided, I'm sorry, I didn't realise I was supposed to be paying tax. Can you sort me out? Uh, and <laughs> Bookkeepers doing what bookkeepers do best, of course, getting it all sorted. And, and so that's brilliant. So well done, Claire. It's a lot of hard work. But, you know, yeah, uh, uh, 
there's another another taxpayer on who can help us all share the bill when we come to the end of all this um oh you are working really hard today folks i'm very proud of you all uh debbie's come back she's got some more information on the hmrc document released yesterday on the extension it says that in relation to employees who have started employment since the 20th of march the last pay period prior to the 30th of october provides the basis for the calculation for employees on variable pay or hours employed after the 20th of March, the average of the tax year 2021 up to the start of the furlough, revise the basis for the calculation. So, okay, this is becoming clearer now. So anyone, as we said, who was employed under the original scheme. Oh, thank you. So I just had a cup of tea come in on my left hand. Thank you. I have a butler, that you see, it's really good. <laughs> you have a drink there for a minute. I'll just give, I'll give, you, give you a slight break. Um, as yeah. I mentioned this morning, Jack has just been taping some of her presentations for conference. It's for a science. smart jacket. Yeah, and um, Peter Stewart, who most of you will remember from the Inspire Tour, where he kept changing his tie and then caught out everybody afterwards by saying, well, how many times did I change my tie? So he's a bit of a, <laughs> a comic, as we all know. Um, he's just received all the kit at home because he's having to do the, the stuff from there. And he lives in Ealing, so he's just sent something saying, hi from Ealing Studios. So <laughs> for those of you who, who remember what Ealing Studios mean, uh, Peter, it probably means we're going to expect an Oscar winning performance again. Oh. So, yeah. I have to say, it's, it's, it's going quite well. It's, it's quite a scary experience. I'm used to standing up in front of a live audience and getting some feedback. Doing this, I have I have a computer with my slides on, which is the one I'm using now. And I have a laptop with my notes on. And then I have this, we have this camera, which is I've got between the two, which has got the light on it, which is based on an iPhone with a, with a lovely sort of halo light around it, which is filming me. We've had to move all the furniture around so that we can get a plain background. And um, it took about an hour to set up this morning. But I have to say, the lads in the back room who are helping us out are absolutely amazing. Um, it's fairly new equipment to them i think as well and and they have been very supportive this morning and i have to say now a public thank you to uh the two young gentlemen who have been helping me out this morning i won't embarrass them by saying their names but they are brilliant so and also they've ensured me that all the little bloopers and that that are going you they're going to wait it out quite nicely so by the time you get to see it it should be um quite good well, Jackie always does rise to the top when there are young gentlemen around. So, you know, we're <laughs> oh, yes. uh, and the team itself, of course, um, all managed by uh, Tentacle Films, which is the company we've worked with for a long time, Jordan Copeland. Um, he's actually obviously husband to Amy Copeland, and uh, he does all sorts of videos and uh, work for some of the big companies. And we're really pleased to have him. Um, we. We, we get mates rates, which is quite useful, which means we don't break the budget. But yeah, he's been working with, he's done all our films for, well, however many years, 10, 11 years that we've been doing Summit. So he knows as well. He knows yeah. as well. So anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, and I've done, I've, I've got about another three to do this afternoon after I've finished here. So it's going to be a long day today. However, that's part, the, part and parcel. Um, okay, couple of things come in that I just need to confirm. Um, oh, I, I love you all. You're doing so good at sending all this stuff in for me. Um, the minimum time that you can claim is for a week. So I think within that week, it doesn't really matter. There's not a minimum work period, but the minimum time that you can cover a claim for is one week. And um, as Kevin's just said to remind me, thank you, Kevin, um, that they are gonna be a lot tighter on the deadlines. Um, the first month, the first claim has to be in by the 14th of December and then monthly after that. So with the first CJRS and the early days, you were given a, a length of period and you could claim as and when you wanted to. And it took us a while to get going. You've got to get your figures correct because there are deadlines now that you can claim and they are the 14th of each month. So you have to go away and work out, work out your dates. Um, Susanna's come back. Uh, yeah, it says specifically if they're eligible for furlough previously, even if they haven't been furloughed before. That's absolutely correct. Um, Caroline Walsh. Hi, Caroline. I agree. It is the if the employ employee has requested to go back on the payroll to receive the furlough amount, the employer is not comfortable with it anyway, just needs the correct answer for the employee. 
So basically what's happened is the employer saying, no, we don't want to take you back. And the employer saying, please take me back. I don't think the legislation says they have to be taken back. I said they can be taken back because obviously to take someone back and follow them, the employer who is not getting any work out of them, presumably, or only a very small amount, has still got to pay the tax and NI. So there is a cost implication to the employer for taking people back on. And if there is no job, then I, I don't think there is an obligation to take people back unless anyone's read that slightly differently. I think they can take them back, but of course there's a cost implication to it. So. Interesting one from CPS. Hi, my yeah. client pays signal staff. Those who would have no hours in some months in a normal year, will they be able to claim furlough for them for the months for these employees? Um, I mean, that, I mean, if you've got a group of fruit pickers or something or other, I mean, yeah, they I mean, all I, get paid, would they? You can't. I really think do. if you've got contracts, and you know, if yeah, like. Again, I think you've got to be able to justify. The thing is, if, you, if they're seasonal workers, you've got to look at the average. So if they've been furloughed before, you're using the old furlough. It's an average all that month. So if they weren't working in the, in say November normally, the best that you could get from them is an average of the last 12 months, which is gonna be quite low. So if it's that low, there may not be any uh, employers NIC or pension contributions to take into consideration. Mm. Um, and Shelley, oh, here's an interesting one from Shelley. This is to do with directors. For my director, I have treated them like they are full-time hours, 40 hours per week, the same as their employees. That's absolutely fine. That is a perfectly valid basis on which to calculate director's hours. My concern is that in the hours that you're claiming for the furlough, can you say hand on heart that the director is not performing any income generation services? Because if they are, that means they're working. And that I think with flexible furlough is where the, 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 the issues could arise. Um, John Alabaster has come back with an interesting uh -huh. one. Bit of a rave from the grave. I haven't heard this for a while. Brexit, remember that? Um, yeah, well, it's it's not Brexit anymore. It's EU transition. Um, I am in the process of putting information together on this. We're getting a lot of questions coming through. I was hoping to get the first article out on this uh, last month, but I'm actually, we think what we're going to do now is put a, a fairly lengthy article out in the November newsletter, or we'll get it up on the website as soon as possible. I know what's happening with import VAT. I'm still trying to sort out the rules of exports. Um, basically, with EU transition, we're now into imports exports. Now, what I will say about EU transition from January is that Northern Ireland, if we thought the whole thing was complicated, Northern Ireland is going to be treated very differently to the rest of the UK because they are still part of the EU for VAT because of the Northern Ireland Protocol Agreement. So for England, Wales and Scotland, anything that is bought or sold outside the UK is going to be treated as an import export, not as a reverse charge. So yes, to all intents and purposes, that will probably go. However, I will remind you that we are going into domestic reverse charge. And uh, as, a, as a little, uh, plug for one of my sessions on the summit, I'm actually looking at CIS and the new reverse charges that are going to take place uh, from the 1st of March. So if anybody's interested in looking at that, I'm going to try and explain how that's going to work. But yes, effectively, from the 1st of January, England, Wales and Scotland are going to be dealing with imports exports. Northern Ireland will remain exactly the same as it is for business to business transactions. Simple answer to a very complex problem. All right, John. Uh, John Balcourt says, do we have up to 14 days to make a claim from the 14th of the month? Um, the claims have to be made by the 14th of the month for the previous month. So anything that you claim for November has to be, the claim has to be in by the 14th of December. Now, whether you can extend that over to claim the first couple of weeks of December is what we're not sure about yet. 
Okay. Um, this one is to do with grants. My client is a limited company with two directors and no other staff. They both work from their homes and have no rateable business premises. They're a food PR company and have been massively hit by COVID. Are they eligible for any of the grants being offered? There is a possibility they will be. Um, the government have issued grants to rateable value properties and we put those up last week, but there are also additional grants that have been given to local authorities to which companies can apply. And I know that in previous grants, members have come back to say they've managed to apply for grants for their clients who weren't otherwise eligible. So the answer is to contact your local authority and see what grants are available um, for that particular business. There may or may not be some, but it is at the discretion of the local authority. So I think I said last week, you might get a company in one local authority that's not going to get the grant and then a company in the next door local authority working exactly the same situation may get one. So uh, we'll take it from there. Sarah Douglas has said thank you, Jackie, for saying thanks earlier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all things Scotland, I tend to go to Sarah. Uh, and Nicola, I go to for Wales. I'm sorry if there's other people that I, I, I that helped me out as well, but those are the two that, uh, that I tend to go to for uh, for my initial uh, help because I know I could get a, a sane, sensible answer from them. Don't I, Sarah? <laughs> um, Judith's come back and said, I would say the reduced hours are a temporary contract change and use the old hours. Again, I think we're back to, if you can justify what you're doing, you've just got to be able to keep the figures and prove it. Hayley says, hi, both. If an employee has been on furlough but is due to be dupe transferred to another company later this month, will they still be eligible for furlough? It's as if nothing has happened when you're on dupe, isn't it? Technically, mm. um, you yeah. have to be given same benefits or better you can't be given anything that is yeah. lower than you um, would normally have expected had your employment continued however there is a date to that that we found out um because it involves a transfer of company i think the eligibility claim works because we're transferring into a new system and i and i i read something earlier this week that we we downloaded and i sent to a member um that if the if they have moved up is before or after so that 23rd of september date comes in so at the moment as i understand it the tube is slightly different so if you're in that situation please go to look at the tube uh details under the extended scheme because i think it's changed slightly so again i will write tube down and get back to you jeff says Great Britain, different from Northern Ireland. The political declaration has not been agreed yet. Non-tariff barriers, etc. No. So I could be boring here. F, no such thing as boring when you're giving people information. Trust me. No, absolutely. Um, Holly, if you reinstate Holly Tyers, if you reinstate an employee, would they have to join the pension scheme again? Not an actual issue. <laughs> just think out loud. Uh, well, everybody has to be given the right to join a pension scheme. That's a legal requirement. They don't have to take it up. Um, and there must be no, um, no pressure put on them not to take it up. Uh, it has to be their choice. Um, yes, they have to be. What they have to do with the pensions is they actually, if they're, if they're eligible, they have to be also enrolled and then they withdraw. They can't withdraw mm -hmm. uh, before uh, they're also enrolled under the new scheme whereas before you could opt in there are only certain areas now where you can opt in there is to do with age and the amount of income that you get but if you're within the age range and you're earning over a certain amount you have to be auto enrolled and then you opt out um right let's just see if we've missed anything um, 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 um. oh jeff has said my client had people who worked overtime the jcrs calculated gave amounts above their ordinary gross pay i only claim the gross pay not the amount the calculator said i could claim well we did agree from day one that if overtime is a regular payment then it should be included in the furlough which did make it slightly different difficult for some calculations but we i think we did agree in the earlier days that you could claim for overtime 
but it has to be either not necessarily contractual, but proven that it's part of their normal working week. So maybe if it's just a one off week, don't include it. If it's a regular thing, then include it. Um, Jenny says for the sales claim, how do you justify the claim? As clients' business have been impacted due to COVID, but still need to do their VAT returns and payroll on time, yet they want us to charge them less fees as not so much work to do. This then means we have an impact on our sales, so can we claim for sales? Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, it I've... says if your income has been impacted because of COVID and if your uh, hours have gone down and you're charging less, then yes, go for the claim. Be um, in says two, it had to be that either your income had gone down or your expenses got, had gone up for a particular period of time. This time, it says that your income has to have been impacted. So we're not looking at increased expenses. We're looking at reduced income. Um, and Nicola says, so to confirm, an, a company can make employees use their holidays while on furlough. I don't know whether I'd like the word can. I'm not sure it's a legal obligation. I think it's something that has to be agreed because the business, I'm not sure whether you can force them to take holiday when on furlough. Well, I think they can. Yeah, there was a lot of conjecture about this at the beginning, mm. wasn't there? I think the problem is that if your staff have now been furloughed for nine months or will have been furloughed for nine months and possibly into March as well, everybody suddenly wanting four weeks holiday plus another four weeks holiday is going to cripple even more businesses. So um, I think... If you're being honourable and helping your staff, I think they should be honourable and take some of it as holidays, you know. So, yeah. But I think, no, as I says, that's a conversation to have. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, it, of course, it all has to be done in agreement with them and it has to be written in agreements and everything. And HMRC, don't forget, will any agreements that you have under this, um, HMRC can go about and ask to see those agreements and you do have to have them in writing. Um, okay, there is... Um, a question coming in on the chat line from Janet. Yeah, I just seen that. Yeah. Um, I have a childminder that has a member of staff that has been told to shield. Have we got to work out claim based on the last time as they are funded and private, which makes a difference on what the employee can claim? Uh. For those businesses that are partly publicly funded, we're still in the same situation that we were before where you can only claim furlough for the private part of the income because the funded part is not furlough based. So I don't know whether we're back with looking at people working full time for the funded money and then not working and furloughed or whether you, 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 you split it at how you're going to do that. The one thing that I have, I have not, and I do have a contact that I meant to ring and ask before today, but I haven't had a time, is shielding. What is happening with shielding? Because Shielding is not a compulsory thing. And if you've got extremely vulnerable workers, can you furlough them, even if there's work for them to do? I, again, I will um, try and get an answer from that. I have um, someone I can ring who I know has just had that discussion with uh, members of staff. So I will come back on that one. Um, I think the questions we're, we're getting to the stage now where either they're getting exhausted or you are, Jackie. I mean, it's, it's time cut for the rest of you got work to do. Um, just a couple of things to catch up while you have a look at the last stragglers there. Um, one of the things I've been doing on my Zooms this morning is interviewing um, some of my some of our new uh, team members, uh, a couple of whom we've never even actually met, but uh, it's coming up to their three months and we're, we're going to keep keep them on. We'd be pleased to know. So, uh, Sue Jay, that many of you have spoken to, particularly those starting new practices, Maddie, who's our main port of call when you ring in, and Alina, that uh, also answers phones, but is looking after our Eastern European offices. Uh, they they all did really well this morning. And to a to a, a, a man or a woman, to a person, they're saying what great people you are to talk to. They're having lovely conversations with you all, and they're really pleased that you always seem very very positive. And that's great. And I think they were concerned when they first started that they get all the grumbling people ringing in. Not the case. Uh, you're fantastic. And they're really pleased to help. And they keep saying, is there anything else we can do to improve? And Maddie, funnily enough, she said they keep saying, no, everything's fine. And she said, I'm trying to get something to help me move, move the surface forward. I said, well, you know, don't worry about it. I think if people like what we're doing, that's good. Now, we are running a bit behind on yeah. some of our emails uh, because we're getting thousands so many. of um, 
we, I looked at one box this morning, which we managed to clear last night. We've had 131 in again this morning. Um, we are getting through them. Uh, and But what I'm saying is actually we'll probably pick up the phone sometimes and answer rather than put it back in, in an email because when we send out an email answer, you then ask another question. And, you know, we're, we're bouncing around a lot. But, Jackie, you've been absolutely hit with, with so many of these. Yeah, I've got about 10 in my inbox coming this morning, which um, if, if it's come to me, if it's the furlough one, it'll come to me and I will try and get back to you, but I may not get back to you till early yeah. next week. But it is what we do, so don't don't not do anything. No. Now, that's what we are here for. It's part of our service. And, and in fact, I, I got a form through the other day um, to talk about the new team and everybody else and, and how many we were taking on. It was, it was for a, an article or something. And they said, um, can you list all your staff broken down by age and sex. So I just wrote all of them. Anyway, um, <laughs> we've got uh, and something new coming up on Monday. I have mentioned it before, but first time on Monday at two o'clock, ICB TV, we're starting a new series called Mike on Monday or Mike's Monday, I'm quite decided yet. Uh, Mike Jardine, who is one of our inspectors, who has just come on board as a full-time team member now, not just uh, as an inspector, but he is deputy MLRO. He's going to be working with Steve Hardwick because, um, you know, we're getting uh, far more AML work and uh, compliance work than we've ever had. Um, now, on Monday, he's going to give you a brief rundown of what AML, as far as the inspector is concerned and we're concerned, is all about anti-money laundering what you need to think about. And then he'll run down what he's going to be doing on, a, on each successive Monday. He's going to have a brief, it might be 20 minutes, it might be half an hour uh, presentation about one particular part that when he goes out to do inspections, it's somewhere where perhaps you're falling down or actually people are being successful at getting it. He's going to talk about that. So you'll be able to ask some questions. Uh, I'm certainly going to bring him on for the first one, but I think he, he might be um, just doing presentations coming on subsequently. But I think this is going to be good because we are getting uh, an increasing number of people who are actually getting worried about inspections. And, and really, you shouldn't do. If you're following the rules, which most of you, thankfully, are, then that's great. It's quite simple, but it's for your benefit that you do your anti-money learning because you don't want to be involved with crooked people. You don't want to get your practice or your reputation ruined because of somebody like that. And we're there to help. We always are. And, you know, we we used to have, after inspection, three categories, uh, compliance, partially compliant, non-compliance. We've taken out partially compliant. If you're partially, you know, if you've got little things that you need to polish up on, we'll do that and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll put that one down to experience. Uh, and then we will um, just concentrate on those people who are really doing lots of things wrong. And we, unfortunately, we have got a few of those. But so that's Mike Monday. Uh, we are we're pleased to say that we have extended our summit coverage now into the Republic of Ireland. We've got quite a few students and members down there. And uh, one of our uh, partner organisations into it is launching in the Republic of Ireland. So we're going to be doing something down there on the day. We will be going at the moment on uh, for the for the summit. We'll be going to it's about 70 countries at the moment. Uh, but obviously the UK is where it's all coming from. So it's mainly UK. So, so that's going well. Um, if you haven't already booked for a summit, please do. Uh, there is such a lot of information going to be crammed into that, such a lot of useful stuff. And I had a, a conversation yesterday with a, a lady who was saying, I'm really, really sorry, but um, I'm, I'm, now, because of lockdown, I'm, I'm not able to do what I did before and I'm not going to be able to make conference. So could I have my money back? So I said, well, yes, but you do realize that it, you can actually look at it for three months. Ah, she said, oh, well, that's brilliant. She was so relieved. She'd be so, quite upset that she was going to miss all this. Well, you can watch it live. Uh, you can watch it uh, a day later, anything up to 30 days later, and you can retain it. You can. Uh, go back over it in case you miss something or, um, you know, obviously in Jackie's case, you will just want to hear it all again. Then you can go through that as well. So uh, please don't think that you've got to be there glued to your screen from uh, 10 o'clock on uh, Tuesday right the way through till uh, midnight on, on uh, Wednesday or whatever it is. We've got a lot of external speakers. We've got a few personalities uh, like Juliet um, Foster, who is coming to us direct from uh, Sky Business Television. So she's a, 
a, a very well-known person in the business circle. She's going to be doing some work for us. And uh, we approached her and she has been learning quite a lot about ICB, so much so that she keeps coming back with different things she could do for us and other ways that she can help us. She is uh, so positive now about you as young entrepreneurs, uh, people coming back in after working, after having uh, different careers, people coming back into the workforce after, after having children or illnesses or retiring or whatever it is. And uh, yeah, she's just, she's just absolutely um, over the moon about it. So um, hopefully that will reflect in, in some of her work for Sky as well. Um, they are, let me tell believe it or not, seven weeks today is Christmas Day. Seven weeks, can you imagine that? You know, we've been closed since mid-March. This is incredible, isn't it? So that's 49 days. But actually, uh, I know this isn't the case for bookkeepers, but if you were looking at a, a Monday to Friday, that would only be 35 working days. But uh, yeah, it's it's draining away fast. But anyway, Jackie, have you picked up anything there that you want to comment on before? Uh, just a few oh. things. Um, a couple of things. Uh, Joanne, I'll arrange for someone to contact you if, uh that hasn't already happened i think it's in the pipeline but joanne will know what i mean about that the only other thing i think that i want to pick up is this holiday thing and again uh, a couple of you have said i think judy said on acas it says you can ask them to take holidays but not force them but in scotland dear sarah's come back and said yes you are allowed to force holiday during furlough hr department edinburgh confirmed this so uh it's a misconception that you're not allowed to force holidays Staff may not like it, but it is allowed. And someone else, I think it's Hannah, has come back and said, if you are asking stroke telling your staff taking holiday, you need to give them twice the amount of notice as the length of holiday you're making them take. So uh, I don't know whether that is um, how different people are reading the legislation or whether it's different north or south of the border. But uh, I think the rest are um, shielding, anything on shielding apparently hmrc have now said that they are contacting everybody um who is extremely clinically vulnerable and they can be fielded but again i've got it on my list we will come back uh, to you but i don't think i think all the rest are sort of repeat questions or slightly different yeah. so have a I'm look on the looking, i think, I think you've answered about 70 questions today Jackie, yeah i think yeah i think it's about I think right plus the ones on the chat line so thank you all for that you've been extremely um, busy so i think really to to finish off and let you all start your weekend thank you so much for joining uh thank furlough it's friday yet again as i say monday we look forward to seeing you for uh, mike on monday which is the start of that I think Jackie will probably be nipping in and out next week with a few different updates as they change. Uh, still can't tell you who the president of the United States is, although it looks <laughs> as if we, we might have a change. Uh, everything else here is, is doing OK. And just as we were talking about our new team members, one of the people that we employed who started this week, Antonia, is actually the 100th um, team member since we started the Institute 24 years ago. So I don't think that's bad. We've done pretty well. So um jackie thank you again as always i know it's been a busy morning you've got more to line up for this afternoon yeah and, um everybody's going to benefit from it i just hope that the world doesn't change over the next week and you have to go back and re-record it but anyway <laughs> um, <laughs> it is a it oh, is one of the problems in the moment, isn't it so thank you everybody it's been lovely to have you with us again and uh see you next week be very careful stay away from covid and let's let's you know Go careful out there, as they say. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you all. Bye.